uh, my um, sort of mantra for the event or my moving to the US. The little uh, little picture on the side there is a picture of my civil audience participation section. Mars. <laughs> Mars. Yeah, that's right. Very good. It's a picture of Mars. Um, I've always been fascinated by that kind of stuff. But I think it's a great, the pictures on the Mars website is fantastic. And whether you're in that sort of group of people here who think this is actually a picture of Arizona of dust, <laughs> or the, and your government sort of mocking the whole thing up somewhere in the desert, or uh, whether you think there's a, I'm inclined to think there's a probe up there on Mars. What never ceases to amaze me about the, the primary headache seem to be able to put a little, uh, quite a sophisticated probe on Mars, land it exactly right, don't have it crash at all, take pictures like that, and uh, people with uh, headache disorders, like uh, cluster headaches, that continue to suffer on the Earth. I think it's completely unconscionable that we would have this sort of technology and not apply it um, to ourselves, to uh, human problems. So the other thing for me in the picture what I see, I see dirt, of course, but what I see is, uh, 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 is the possibility of doing stuff. One of the things which attracts me to the US is a kind of um, youthfulness about the culture that uh, has an ability to want to do stuff. You would never convince the Europeans to go to Mars. Well, you could, but it would be such a committee. <laughs> Discussion. I mean, just, be, just go on forever. You, got, you guys can go to Mars. So I have a youthful, I join your youthful enthusiasm, not in youth, but enthusiasm. But it's possible to do stuff. And I think that um, one could do stuff in headache if we you know, put our heads to it. So, next slide. Let's see what we might want to do. We'll come a long way in 20 years, I think, um, in the cluster headache business. It used to be that, uh, it used to be, uh, it used to be that, uh, probably you'll hear me anyway, because I'm not yeah. allowed my voice. It used to be that, um, it used to be that it was called all sorts of weird things. The picture on the side is, to, is a piece of artwork from a cluster patient. Most of you, uh, I guess you recognize the context of it as opposed to the specificity. And it's been called all sorts of funny names. Um, I know many of you probably almost everyone, doesn't actually like the term cluster headache. Uh, these were the terms that were used before. Some of them, I mean, it, it is a bit easier at least than some of those terms. But maybe try to explain to an insurance co company in the second last bullet point. <laughs> Spend all your time just spelling it. Um, one of the, the English are famous for understatement, and one of the uh, greats of the mid 20th century English neurology was Charles Simons, who, um, who didn't call cluster headache, cluster headache. He didn't call it migrant neuralgia. I think it's because he didn't get on with the guy who named it migrant neuralgia, who was a, another English chap. So he just called it a particular variety of headache. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful. Um, How imaginative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what a chap. Um, he introduced the use, actually, of a glutamine, right there, glutamine, for the, for the treatment. <laughs> he, um, so in 1988, the, the, the things got codified in this uh, IHS system. I think that was probably a useful development because it did, what it's done, um, and it's subtle but it's important, is it's given a way to deal with governments um, and payers by classification. And when you get ICD-10, which has cluster headache specifically as a diagnostic entity, the World Health Organization's accepted that, it will mean there's a box that people can tick. And uh, administrative people, if they love nothing else, they love boxes that they uh, tick. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a lot to say, isn't it, that uh, up till about the um, uh, early, well, mid-1990s actually, the, the disorder was thought of as being, um, well, it, you know the typical thing that said uh, that it was a disorder of men, which Disenfranchises some of you somewhat. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, a disorder of, uh, of 
obsessive uh, sort of, they said that people had faces like lions, which I suppose is a bit unshaven. Uh, and all that sort of crazy stuff, it was though there was some way you could look at a person and stamp their head. And apart from the rather prominent um, cigarette butts out of, at the back there, <laughs> there aren't any other things which mark across the headache gathering that I've system, uh, it changed in, uh, we, we changed it in 2004 to add that thing I've underlined. This is the system that the International Headache Society uses and I say ICD-10 will, will take this system up. It covers, in my experience, it covers 99 out of 100 of you, but actually pretty much covers 100. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very close, particularly when we added the sense of restlessness and, uh, and agitation which was not in the original definition, but it's been good for teaching. And um, one of the other things that are useful for this definition system is a way to teach uh, students. You can't teach the old guys new tricks. You've got to drag them. But students are very uh, malleable when you start to show them a, a disorder, particularly if they can get a good grip on it. Um, their attitude is vastly different. And it's uh, students where the future is. And this definition system is useful. But I'm going to come back to this sense of agitation and uh, Restlessness because there's actually some good biology around um, what's going on during that. It goes to, it's, it's, we're starting to understand why you would run around wanting to bang your head against the wall, uh, as opposed to just not withstanding the pain. Next slide. In the early days when we were interested in this, we uh, started to we started to ask some of the more you know, obvious questions like what's going on uh, diagnostically. And this was some work that, uh, uh, that Anish Barra did when she, she was with us doing her, uh, doing her research. We went out to see what was going on with the diagnosis. And um, the, the, you can see that in the 50s, uh, it could be quite bad. Now, the, the mean time to diagnosis in the 50s was uh, more than 20 years. That's a long time um, to be walking around in, in, in the dark, it has to be said. Things have improved, uh, at least in the UK, to about two to three years. And on average, you have to see two to three primary care physicians before the penny drops. Uh, I haven't got enough. There's no, there's no good population based data here to understand that, uh, what, what that problem is like here. It wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't much different. It's a, sh it's, it's a dreadful thing because if you wander around for years without a diagnosis, you never going to get any sort of management strategy. The funny thing about medicine, of course, is the little symbol there, the, the drawing of the person pulling their hair out. Doctors think that's them, which is so dumb. Um, <laughs> probably, it, it, it's not our problem. That's a drawing, obviously, of someone with a cluster headache. But all too often, we, the medical people think it's a problem if they can't make a diagnosis. Actually, it's the patient's problem. Uh, and it's our challenge. But, you know, I like to refocus my colleagues on the challenge and opportunity as opposed to the frustration. Make them remember that you're the people pulling your hair out, not them. Next slide. Um, we also looked at what happened to uh, people. Um, we were interested in this question, uh, many of you would have had this experience, no doubt, of going to other practitioners. People do what they do, you know. So, uh, unsurprisingly, we found that if uh, your uh, people with cluster headache went to a dentist, they'd get their teeth pulled out and stuff like that. That's what dentists do. They don't like, uh, you know, they, they don't just talk. They don't talk very much at all. They usually stick something in your mouth, say it's sharp, or anesthetize, but you can't speak. Uh, about half of the cluster patients we surveyed in, in, in the US had had various things. All sounds pretty horrible. Filing teeth, that sounds really gross. I, I don't know why someone would do that. But that, that they're all those people cluster. Our ENT colleagues do what they do. They wash and clean and spray and such things all over the place. And of course, if you see an optician, you get glasses, because like, that's what they've got. They've got like, rows of glasses, um, so you'd expect them to give you glasses, so that's not very helpful. The best people to see in the UK are ophthalmologists who do nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been to their meeting and congratulated them around the um, I think if they do nothing and just send you someone to someone who does something other than filing your teeth, washing your nose out, or giving them glasses, that's 
that's constructive, and I've encouraged my ophthalmological colleagues to continue to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and that told me a lot. I spent um, the, some time in the, uh, in the UK doing talks to the Eastman Dental Institute, the dental trainees, just to try and make them understand that if it wasn't clearly a tooth problem, there was actually no good reason to drill. <laughs> and pulling and doing the root canal once was maybe helpful, but three times that was unlikely to be helpful. There's nothing like seeing someone with cluster headaches, a nerve just root problem as well. So, next slide. <laughs> 